Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Tio No, the Last of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalover. And right now, we're continuing on with our little campaign with a PRC, but now called the Provisionary Central Siberian Revolutionary Council, the PCSRC. But the, the greater good. Major Elari Kovalev listened to the Assembly's complaints for an hour straight without a single interruption. Unlike his colleagues, Kovalev was patient with the civilian bureaucracy, even with all the red tape one had to cut through. Strangely to Kovalev, the voices had become polarized in opposite directions. In the conquest of the rest of Siberia, many warlords had come under the wing of the People's Revolutionary Council. No longer was it one lone army allied with steppe peoples, but a serious contender to the unite the nation under the ideals of the October Revolution. Unfortunately, the ideological drift of the different Russian politics, or Polities had created such intense zealotry that even now defeated Siberia was awash with civil disobedience and outright uh, terrorism. These traitors must be hunted down. Every rat must be forced out into the light and crushed. I thought you military men knew how to get it done. A young firebrand Mongol shouted at Major Kovalev, stabbing his finger at a report of a railway line being sabotaged by counter-revolutionary elements. It was a mistake the train didn't derail and end in thousands of deaths. Having saved all of his energy for the moment, Kovalev leveled a powerful stare at the young man. His voice was a bassy rumble that shook the room. With all due respect, the proposal for dealing with these acts is nothing short of medieval. Forced resettlement, summary executions, these collective punishments will only alienate people who have come under our protection. Not everyone is at fault for the actions of these few actors. If we are to one day extend our borders to the breadth and width of Russia, we cannot lower ourselves to such base, punitive measures, even if it costs us. <clears throat> of course, this answer didn't suit the civilians, but it did dull their bloodthirsty perspective. Thankfully, these two sides can discuss this matter in the open as equals, in which we've just finished up Kosin's legacy, so that is good. <clears throat> but right now, a way of hope. Defenders of the Union versus pardon them, as well as smash them. Uh, let's see, we have defeat Warlord Pockets, which will lower military loyalty but decrease coring, coring time, which is okay, as well as the trial decision required. Or we do make an offer and towards peace and unity, which you do get more consumer goods, which I actually kind of prefer. I did say I want to do more with the civilian stuff, but currently, our loyalty, actually I've already raised loyalty a little bit earlier, um, and there was a comment for yesterday saying we should go down the military route, even though I want to do the civilian route, I don't mind doing some of the military stuff, so we'll see what happens, but I definitely want to raise the army loyalty because I gave a lot of the territory to the, you know, the army. I gave some to the civilians as well, but army loyalty is currently at 70%, so let's do the army one for now. Pardon them. We cannot pretend that this revolt was simply an act by rabble-rousing anarchists. The fact is, many workers were swayed by the points made by Kostin and his ilk. They are distrustful of us, making them more susceptible to laws and demagoguery. Pardoning the, the leaders of this revolt as the first step of goodwill, allowing them to go home and back to their families. Acts of retribution against former rebels will be punished. Reforming our treatment of the workers is just as important. The life of the worker must be made healthier, safer, and comfortable than before. Unsafe work environments must be dealt with, in addition to incompetent bureaucrats that are more concerned with maintaining production quotas than the well-being of workers. We will prove our enemies wrong through our deeds. Nice. Now, we, still, we still have to deal with this stuff, which is fine. Uh, keep boosting us up, because we don't get that much PP. We still get... 0.33, which is not too bad, but also, as you see, I did delete the aircraft division, or the aircraft division, the helicopter division, just because it wasn't reinforcing. There's no point keeping it if it's not going to reinforce, but, uh, and we still have zero here, but it did give us, push us to make this division a little bit faster, so hopefully this division reinforces when we're in the field. There's no guarantee, as you see, I did make our guys 40 combo with as well, even though I think I did that last time too, so there you go. Very nice. As we're struggling to catch up in terms of industry, pretty much with everyone else, so. We're trying to build, 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 build. Pardon them, and then make an offer. Oh no, actually, we want to integrate our lands to reduce the strain. Up until now, most of our land has been under de facto martial law, operated by military personnel and local sympathizers. This has made administrating the land very difficult for us. This is why we must begin the long, arduous process of officially integrating the land into our bureaucracy. This will require local organs of, lo of administration that are loyal to the government, bringing back old civil servants found politically reliable, and increasing services that would improve our ability to maintain control. The military's role will be scaled back, at least in official capacity, followed up with birth of a state. The territories have been integrated. Our people are now being unified as we speak. In the air is a new cause, a new feeling among the people that is beginning to unify them under a single banner. It is a development of a newfound national identity, based around the ideological beliefs of Marxist-Leninism, and for the creation of a united state for Russia and her peoples. If you'd like to read about better industrial equipment, please go ahead. Excellent. But in order for a state to be created, order must be maintained. Not just the law, of the law, but of the nature of society itself. Everyone knows their place, and they may advance at a pace that will be beneficial to the state of the dictatorship, of the proletariat, and the state alone. We are entering a new era, a new era of order, for now and all time. 
and both will get, begin to slowly improve. Not too bad. Maybe do a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm. You know, it's very hot. Nice. Very good. Birth of the state will be good. And we have a little bit more political power, but that's not too bad. Oh, there goes the divine mandate. They're doing quite well. And what do we have over here? Finish. Oh, we can finish army modernization. We don't have that much army XP, so what does this do? You get the Iron Beast. Army professionals will begin to rapidly improve, plus 15% bonus to all military branches. I mean, honestly, okay, so we start off very, like, I said in the past few episodes, very, very difficult. Like, it's not a position where I want pretty much anyone to start playing as. Like, if you do not recommend the PRC, you recommend any nation in Russia to play as in TNO. But, if you can survive like we've managed to, and you do this infantry attack, like, 35% more attack is insane. 30% more defense is also very good as well. Organization regain and division trade time is okay. This one's better, in my opinion. But air assault, that's not too bad either. Um, we do have enough for this, so... I mean, this is... 40% more infantry attack. That's... That's a little nuts, not gonna lie. Um, we could finish modernization, but let's let's get this one first, maybe. We, we're almost there anyways for command power, so... You know, we might as well, right? There we go. Nice. Beautiful. Birth of a state. <clears throat> and we do have 35 army XP. Uh, army XP. PP. And actually 75%, 73% civilian loyalty, huh? Pursue favors? Uh, I probably don't empower them, but their loyalty needs to go up more, though. So we'll probably have to do that one. Um, I We haven't done anything in terms of this actual stage that we're at. Expertise would be nice. Invest in construction. I want to do poverty. I'm going to save our PP for poverty. Make an offer. We've already spilled enough blood unifying central Siberia. Too many young men, old, young and old, died just to get us this far. It'd be a waste to kill people who would still be of use to us. This is why. Instead of using force, we should use a more peaceful method of creating peace and stability in our new territories. Integration. By offering these holdouts amnesty in exchange for offering their services and generals and soldiers to the Revolutionary Council, we can both utilize the manpower and intelligence of these generals for our own purposes, without the unnecessary bloodshed involved. Which could honestly make us weaker in... If you think about it in the long run. But let's go and do that one too. Thank you very much. And let's make some better guns. PPS H's actually were very, I think, quite effective in the you know actual Great Patriotic War. But, oh, whoops, that cost PP. God dang it. I forgot that, that cost PP. Man, the PRC for Central Siberia, I don't know. It's just, it's definitely not an easy warlord. It's definitely not one of the easiest. The WRF is looking very good. I need to play some more against them. Aaron Brotherhood is still, still picking up though. All right, let's go and finish the reforms too. And there we go. The I Am Beast. <clears throat> it's dawn on the steps again, and Zetsev is ever first to wake. For a moment, he half sits huddled, the blanket around his waist, watching the squad around what remains of the campsite and counting off Edigu, Tudan, Slava, the officer. Then the old academy training kicks into gear, and he's barking orders, rousing his men one by one in a frenzy. And he casts worried glances at the hulk of half painted steel behind them, mentally counting off steps, rehearsing the exercises near its final stage. The men still grumbling. <clears throat> Push the beast. Bankar Tudan calls it. Forward in a lumbering track, its wheels leaving the thick imprints behind it. Zetsev leads them forward, checking the newfound compass and the occasional stirring of the radio for signs of activity. The world slips away in the endless rhythm of push, 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 like a struggling midwife in endless delivery. Wow. Then, in a stroke of mercy, the officer calls for a halt. They found their firing position. Edigu and Tudan spring into action, loading blanks and aiming the beast at pre-rehearsed coordinates. And Zetsev mutters curses under his breath as he interprets the maps in his hands. Then one another... Then another one, and then another one, another shell is fired, and then, blessedly, it is over. As Zetsev summons his men to prepare for the withdrawal and the long trek back to base, the officer smiles and gestures behind him. The young sergeant turns, bewildered, and nearly drops to his knees. The dust is kicking up long trails behind the enemy, or the shiny new motor trucks that now dot the horizon. And the men in them wave and smile, gesturing obscenely. As Zetsev, or Zetsev could touch them now, he'd have tried to kiss them on the lips. Mmm, smooch smooch. Artillery Squad 548 is coming home in style. And, oh, and we didn't make an offer? Yes, please. <clears throat> and actually, what do we have here? Oh, yeah, like we said last time, Western Mongolia is now... <sighs> rebellious. Why is it so bad? Seriously, why is it so bad here? I do not understand why the resistance is still going up. Um, I don't really want to do this, but I don't mind doing this once. Just so we get a guy who can put down resistance here, so... Propaganda campaigns are nice and all, but after this one, peace towards peace and unity. So we can get peace in Central Siberia next. 
Integration is only the beginning. We must unify the people of Central Siberia under one banner towards a better and brighter future. By doing so, we can begin picking up the broken pieces that were the Soviet Union and finally, after all these years, to deal with the problems that plagued the old Union. By doing so, we can not only unify Central Siberia, but all of Russia under one banner of peace and unity, just as the Bolsheviks of old had done. 50%, Jesus Christ. That's insane. Um, yeah, we need more loyalty here, so... I don't, I don't, I don't like the, the political struggle here. I wish we could just, like, go down one route and stick with it. I did say I want to do poverty, but we just kind of are forced to go this way for now. There. And then, peace in Central Siberia. Peace. That is something that Central Siberia hasn't known for a long time. For many years, it has been a heck hole, with bandits and petty warlords playing ruler, leaving the average citizen at the mercy of anarchy and chaos. But no more. We have created order and stability in a, new, a place few expected it. The revolution has been secured for now, but not for long. Only by unifying Russia can it be protected against all potential threats. That is why we must look outward, for the future and safety of our nation and people. Because some political power, stability, reduces strain and raises loyalty, which is nice, but still. Keep boosting it up. Keep boosting it up. I don't want to cut this one, but eh, that's not costing us that much. Well, it's currently minus two every month. God dang it, that sucks. Defenders of the Union. Oh. Or the other one. Let's see. So we did get this one. That's a better transport helicopter, so hopefully it'll go okay for us. And we're doing that stuff as well. Let's grab some industry stuff here. Let's get some more output. We could really use that. 3.63 a month. And do we actually make the division yet? What's going on with this? It's close. 28 a month. Or 28 left we need. Oh, there goes the Brotherhood. Indonesian War. Very nice. And now, Defenders of the Union, a way of hope. Keep the military happy while empowering the citizenry. Well, I want to make sure that the citizenry is happy and their loyalty. So, really, we got to go to the city one just because it's not looking great. Remove citizenry from all states as expensive cost of loyalty. Is below 50. Well, I, I said I will do this campaign again sometime. I think for now, I want to do the civilian route, and we'll do the army one again next time. A way of hope. I'll do that one. <clears throat> the Krasnoyars Conference. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> it's quickly approaching, and those who wish for a restored civilian government are wasting no time preparing. The fate of the People's Revolutionary Council will be decided in Krasnoyarsk, and despite the promises of the generals, this may be the last chance for a union not run by its army. The people of Central Siberia are watching the proceedings anxiously, many hoping that they might finally see a restoration of the old Soviet government. The generals, for the most part, remain opposed despite popular support for strength and civilian control. Many have voiced their concerns over weakening of the state at a time when the union remains shattered and we are still surrounded by enemies. Their arguments are persuasive to many in the halls of power, but and winning out over them will require much work. The bureaucrats can only hope that they still have enough time. So my apologies that if, if you wanted to go down the military route. I think just I want to try the civilian, civilian route. I really want to see how well we can do with the civvies. Uh, yeah, because that's not looking good. So um, I I want poverty next. Like I'm, I'm sick of waiting for it. And usually I, I'm usually pretty good about saving PP up and such, but this time right now, no, not really. No. Five days left, and there goes. Uh, Whoa. Wow, look at that. Oh, and the Jews won in Madagascar. That's cool. That's actually really cool. We have some PP now. Poverty relief, finally. Some poverty relief. Oh, baby boy. Oh, now that's going down. That's going down so fast. Oh, boy. Can we still make this better? No, we cannot. Okay, so you can keep technically keep doing this, but you really can't. So if you do that again... Uh, that goes down. This doesn't go up, so we're kind of maxed out. So... Red Army can get closed. And then to stop your civilian government. Um, only 10 loyalty talk to the generals. Uh, establish a civilian government. The civilian government of the Soviet Union does currently exist, but in a withered form. The Red Army holds most of the power while the government it should answer to is a glorified bureaucracy, however. Whether as it may be, it is not totally powerless, through careful use of what powers they have been granted. Supporters of the civilian government can begin to entrench their position and show they are not a force to be trifled with. This measured demonstration of power will show the people that the Red Army generals, heroic patriots that they are, are not invincible and the bureaucrats are ready for the task of leadership. In the future, this will be remembered as a first step on the road to restoration of the USSR. After years of fighting, a noble clique of revolutionary generals reclaimed the core of their motherland and the rightful government they fought for reasserted itself as a vanguard of the revolution. Now, all that is left to do is formalize the government's power in Krasnoyarsk and secure our rule once and for all. Decide 
power balance. Were the civilian government preparing to take control, there will soon be a clear separation between the military and governments giving it orders. The only question that remains is where that separation will be. With the Red Army playing such a vital role in the conquest of re or reconquest of Central Siberia, many of the new government are pushing for close ties between the state and the military. Despite the current power struggle, the generals have the best intentions for the Union, and to snub them in victory would be unwise. Others argue that the period of military rule exposes how dangerous the military leadership is. They claim that the generals have shown themselves for the power-hungry stratocrats they are, and the only way to preserve the stability of a civilian government is by putting the military in its place. If you'd like to read about better agricultural methods, please go right ahead. For this bread, we thank the Nice. 60%, huh? Oh, wow. Now it's 100%. Jesus. Now it's really nice. So we don't have to spend our PP on that anymore. Instead, I'm going to spend our PP on something here. Probably army, uh, higher important instructors. Better army professionals. I have not seen these guys do this well before. I've seen them win and basically, like, get peace out after they take out Rex Commissari at uh, Sudwest Africa. But never like this, where they take out this area, too. Holy crud. A new future? Uh, well, we'll do, deal, deal with officers first. Most figures of prominence in the Red Army have announced they'll accept the implementation of the new government should the bureaucrats win out, but a few officers still refuse to acknowledge the legitimacy of the Krasnoyarsk Conference. These men are not high-ranking members of the military command, but they're not insignificant either. In the current position, they could severely obstruct the progress of a potential government they would refuse to acknowledge. Fortunately, they do not need to remain in their current positions. Under the guise of administrative reshuffling, most of the disloyal officers can be resigned or relegated to obscurity, sent to oversee tiny garrisons and villages north of the Arctic Circle. The few who cannot be sent away will be made to understand one thing. Disobeying the government is treason, and treason carries only one punishment in the Soviet Union. Very good. Very good. And we get 0.69, not too bad. Talk to the generals. With the officers who refuse to accept the possibility of civilian rule dealt with, we can now turn to the superiors. None of the generals have been so boldly as to, uh, or bold as to openly reject our hypothetical authority, but it is clear that many of them would prefer to continue calling the shots. Luckily, most of the generals are more reasonable than their subordinates, and it is likely we will be able to reach an understanding if the bureaucrats uh, triumph. Generals with known military ambitions will be summoned with the, to the capital for a series of private meetings. We will make it clear to them that even if they should lose power, the Red Army will still play a vital role in government. Throw in a few reminders that we are fighting all for the same Soviet ideals, and the restoration of the Union, they will, and they will likely be putty in our hands. Any who refuse to come around will simply have to face the consequences of their decisions and military loyalty to be slightly raised. You gotta do what you gotta do, you know. Hey look, red, and kind of whitish, and blue. Kind of like the flag of current Russia. Like a like I see the Siberian plan is gone or uprising I mean uprising, uh, not bad not bad. Did we get it? Yep, we got it out. Nice. We have so much army XP. Holy crap! Wow. Um, honestly, I want to make you guys bigger. We don't have enough transport helicopters, but that's okay. So it says minus fifty there. We don't have minus fifty though. Um, hey, nice. Let's have a look. Two fifty. Oh, don't tell me they're not gonna reinforce. Please don't tell me that they're not gonna reinforce. Oh, that's not good. Keep doing industry. Just really focus at home on industry right now. Resources would be good too, but that's fine. If that's the case, hmm. I really want 40 combo with air assault division, so. That'd be good. That'd be very good. Boom, boom. Nope, oh, not infantry. That would slow us way, way, way down. Air assault, air assault, and air assault. I don't think we'll have enough for this, but it's alright. There you go. Cool. Oh, wow. The end of the South African War. Jesus Christ, that's... That's that's impressive. The AI actually will win sometimes. Wow. So, we can take a look at this again. And, as we can see, they're not reinforcing. They're just not re reinforcing. I... Man, I don't know, man. I, I wish that th they would reinforce, but at this point, we must just delete the division and make another one, then. I wish these weren't bugged. I really wish they weren't. Um, how are we doing over here? Regional integration, we're good. Anything up here, I'm, I'm kind of done caring about that stuff. So, let's just focus on this stuff. Oh, How's agriculture doing? We're in mass mechanization. We're not on mag uh, agriculture, agricultural stuff yet, like modern ones, but... Um, agriculture, equipment. Equipment's probably really good to do. But bonus for industry, let's do... I. Expertise is not really great, but... Oh, you get some more infrastructure there, too, though. Infrastructure can help you build things. But industry blueprints, I really like the industry blueprints. It's 50%, too. It's not too bad, actually, so... 
20 and 4, not bad. Any future. The long awaited day is finally drawing near. After months of squabbling and paranoia, the issue of military rule will be settled once and for all. All eyes are on Krasnoyarsk as the bureaucrats, the generals, and the people both wish to represent all anxiously await the results of the conference. Despite fears of coups and plots, it seems that we have managed to avoid the worst excesses of factionalism, but no one will be certain until a definite, definitive result is announced. The future awaits us, and no matter who leads the nation forward, there is still a long road ahead. The motherland lies in ruins after decades of war, and to our east and west lie more potential enemies who would seek to undo everything we have achieved. They shall not succeed. Whether we follow the revolutionary government or the Red Army, one thing is certain, our victory draws near. Nice. Actually, are we making any more divisions? We need... What do we need? We need way more artillery. That's good to know. Way more arty. Let's see. Yeah, we need way, 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 way more arty. Go down here. Go down to get more arty. Planes are actually coming along very nicely, though. So, that's good. So, after that, we did all, everything on the left. Let's be restoring our riches? Probably. We finally, at long last, achieved control over a large portion of Siberia. This is a great victory, but now the real work begins. Our economy, such as it was, was structured wholly around the needs of a military fighting for survival, and yet it now must be retooled to underpin the state as a whole. This will not be simple or fast, but is absolutely necessary, and we need to approach it with the same, we di same way we did our armed campaigns of years recent and otherwise, with determination. We, we achieved victory then, and we will do so once again. Over the Asian continent? That's not bad, I like that one too. The Krasnoyarsk Conference, civilian victory. The primary meetings of the Revolutionary Council of the Krasnoyarsk Conference have concluded, with a resultant political shift towards the reduced influence of military authorities and the government and the empowerment of civilian institutions. Making the argument that despite the state's many enemies both within and without, it was critical to elevate civilian authorities to properly administer the new territories required. Many council members agreed that a transition to civilian-led administration was required. Speeches by several prominent figures subsequent to the decision reinforced this perception and position. Although many senior military figures are reportedly very disappointed by the decision, there is no indication that overt dissent among its members. Indeed, though there may harbor concerns about transfers of power, all agreed that the choice was arrived by legitimate and uncoerced debate and must therefore be respected. It is, however, expected that if the security situation was to suddenly change, the debate would be revisited vigorously. Civilian leadership will bring us forward, civilian rule will get way more political power, and worse consumer goods. Wow, that sucks. Yeah, that's not really... Oh, I don't know, man. Oh, look at that. Cool for the Republic of Ireland. Yeah, I don't know. That hurts our city so badly. But actually, not too bad, actually. That's not too bad. Cool. If that's the case, 80. Maximize everything here. We need we need more cities. We need to be able to build more than this. I'll do that. And 10 to 2, but you can keep you... Ah, go to the bottom, whatever. Fine, whatever. Hmm. Um, manpower. Construction speed would be nice. I think I want to go with more equipment. I want to build a little bit faster. That'd be nice. And give some infrastructure too, so it helps just build faster. Even though it hurts it's consumer goods, but whatever. Civilian victory. News from the recent conference on the powers of the civilian base versus Vasilevsky and the army status quo has come in. After thorough debates, many votes, and spirited discussion, it appears the civilians have won the day in a speech. The leader of the coalitions outlined a few changes that will be made with their victory. As expected, reform and civilian power are at the top or near the top of the list, but the specifics are murky as of yet, save for one particular sticking point. In the coming weeks, a council of civilians will be established and subsequently convened to put checks on Vesilevsky's power within the PRC. This represents a great leap towards proper popular rule in a fair country, and many common folk have rejoiced at the prospect of having a stronger say in the ongo ongoings here. The army and Vasilevsky have accepted their defeat gracefully and continue to faithfully serve the country. Harmony between civilian and military power is yet another step towards their stabilization, and thus even those who have found their power at loss after the conference still look forward to the brighter future. A step towards unity. And we don't replace them though. Okay, that's okay. Establishing a budget. Oh, do we want to do that one? It helps our consumer goods though. We lose so much political power though. Is that really worth it, man? I don't know. I guess we have, to, we have to. As one of the first steps of administering a proper uh, state economy, we must take action to establish a clear budget with all the priorities, competing sectors, and needs that such that such implies. Although some have questioned the need, and though it will surely involve many trade-offs and sacrifices, in the end, establishing this practice will not only increase economic efficiency, but also allow us to track where the money is going. A military might not need that knowledge, but a state very much does. Followed up with, into the modern age. <clears throat> Uh, due to the events of the past two decades, Russia as a whole has quite severely fallen behind the rest of the civilized world when it comes to technology. Our guns, radios, and even our factories. All of them are out of date and flawed when compared to newer types, and this shows in poor quality of our forces relative to those to those outside the former Union. To correct this, we will invest a large amount of money in building research facilities and training new scientists to improve the rate of technological development and allow us to catch up. Good. We could spend it there, but I want to keep doing this stuff. We only have nine divisions. That's really not good. Man, trying to get 40 combat with is... 
Sometimes a mistake. <laughs> Sometimes a mistake. Oh, nice. Getting more output is super important, though. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. Wait, do we still need to do this stuff? Oh, don't tell me we have to... Do Hopefully it just stays this way. Army loyalty is going up by two every month. Don't tell me we still have to do this. I don't want to waste PP on this. Agricultural so social development bonus is three? Nice. So it's 97 and 80%. Please don't change. Please don't change. We already have the election, so... The focus of our economy. Oh, we still have to focus on this. Are you kidding me? Why? We just had the political struggle. Yeah, no. I'm sorry, but this is... The PRC is still a little bugged. It, it's... Uh, why? Why? Uh, let's go and do some equipment, probably. The focus of our economy. After our conquest of Central Siberia over the reactionaries and the anarchists, we now have to sort out our budget. We have a whole new economy we need to administrate, and different industries need to be organized. We must sort the economy before we can even dream of national reunification. We have two options we can focus on. The first would be to prioritize civilian matters, more civilian industries, and infrastructure. Well, this would give us a powerful base and will be surely helpful in the future. Many of our commanders argue that it would be a waste. Instead, they assert the military should be prioritized because it is the most important for the conquest of Russian reunification. New military factories, production, and fortifications, they say, must be built to fully prepare us for the future. It's a difficult decision, but we can balance both. What should we focus on? Well, we did go with the civilian one, so we'll go with the civilian one this time. So, we worker? Yes. With all the suffering uh, the Russia has endured, workers no longer have many real heroes to idolize and try to emulate, causing morale to suffer. Therefore, it is it would be an immense boon to the cause of the workers to invent such a figure. A common laborer, standing tall over Siberia, who places a revolution before himself and works long hours for no other reason to see it succeed and freezing, freeing his fellow workers from the chains. This will be a feature of any priority propaganda poster from Novo Sibiris to Kansk, inspiring the people to serve communism so it may, in turn, serve them. Maintain officer elections? With civilian administration firmly control the apparatus of state, we must turn our attention to the many issues that need resolving. One of the most important is that of the practice of electing military officers. Long an issue of contention among many groups within the government, military, and other spheres, the practice of electing officers within the armed forces is one of the earliest adopted by the council in its initial form. It was believed at the time that such was the only way to ensure confidence in the command structure after the Union's fall. However, these times are long behind us, and many argue that to maintain the practice, given the expansion of the lands and formations within our state, expands the dangers of politicization to an unacceptable degree, in addition to our limiting professionalism besides. This is countered by its supporters, who claim that the practice is essential to assuring the cohesion of our formations. It's clear that a choice will have to be made. All that remains to be seen is what the central civilian government will be decide. The dangers unacceptable and the elections? Elected officers lead us to victory. Keep the elections. Well, what, what, what do they give us? What do they give us? Civilian rule, of course. Overextended administration. Um, the relationships look not too bad right now, actually. Well, democratic military? Where, where is that? Oh, there it is. Um, we lose organization? I'm going to keep it. I think that'd be good. That's very civil for everyone, so... Um, hmm. I'm going to keep it. They lead us to victory. But that's for the army. And we're trying to really focus on the civilian stuff. Ah, I just ended. Ah, uh, sorry. Goodbye. 0.47, Jesus Christ. Yeah, the PRC is not easy to play. It's just really not easy to play at all. Uh, Soviet worker, though, would be good to get done, though. That'd be good. 27, not bad. Could be better, though. Could be better. But at least, it's just 66, and these guys are still struggling, which is very, very good to see. They have up to 12 divisions. They have up to... F yeah, our cruiser is probably going to win. Oh, let me go if we can peacefully reunify with these guys, though, but probably won't be able to. More factory output, please, please, please. 0 0.05, please tell me you're reinforcing, even though I know they're not. Look at that, it's so sad. What's the no point making this division then? Well, goodbye. There's no point having you there, costing us money and stuff like that. 620, and four more artillery pieces, not bad, not bad. Echoes of Kal Kalkingol, oh that's cool. Two men on horseback, so slow to a trot along the often porous eastern border, keeping an eye out for suspicious activity. I don't see anything here, Ludo Gillen. One of the men, Buto Chin Stog, stated. The other man, Ludogin Dandar, nodded but remained warrior. You know, Ludogin, or Ludoglin Gin, I don't think I understand why you decided to see the border for yourself and brought me along with you. Wouldn't it have been better to leave this, this to the soldiers? Turning to face Buto Chin, Ludogin shook his head. Being part of a leader of men is not ordering them to do anything you yourself wouldn't do, and I live by that principle. As for why I invited you out here, he turned away, looking out at the horizon. Do you remember Kalkingol, all the bloodshed, the corpses, and finally the victory? One well, that felt pretty hollow these days, but neither decided to bring that up. Of course I remember. How could anyone ever forget? 
Butuchin said bitterly, if I had known that darn Japanese were going to destroy our homeland like this, I would have killed twice as many as the cowards ran away. Yes, Butuchin definitely had the right spirit for what was to come, Ludo again thought. I've been thinking we should not only liberate the country, we should restore it to the power it held in those days when the rising sun fled from the hammer and sickle. Suddenly, Ludo again grinned mirthfully, though we sure have our work cut out for us, huh? They sure laugh at the last part. Together, they plan to watch the sunset. And farms of the future? Yes. Rapidly improves poverty, please. In order to ensure that none go hungry, reforms are badly needed in the agricultural sector, which has grown inefficient and outdated since the collapse of the Union. Mechanization of the farms and fields is an important part of this, as it is much more labor-intensive for farmers or to grow the crops through entirely or near entirely physical work. Another important part is improvement of conditions for farm workers, which have deteriorated greatly since the Siberian War. Finally, implementing modern farming techniques should allow farmers to produce more crops with less lamb. Together, this will make our agriculture more productive than it has ever been. And here we're at everyone, which we are doing new industrial methods now. While our industrial capacities improved greatly from what it once was, much work remains to be done. The expertise of our workers remains imperfect, especially when compared to those living in those states outside Russia. There are also many inefficiencies in production, especially when it comes to the organization within factories. These problems can be solved by improving the training of industrial experts so that they can compete with the finest and reorganizing industry to streamline production and eliminate any inefficiency. Once that is accomplished, we will reach new heights of productivity and will do import electronic designs. Yes, expenses rise sharply, but industrial equipment begins to rapidly improve. One of the areas in which we currently find ourselves lacking is the design and production of electronics. Disappointingly, this is not a problem we can resolve on our own, and we must rely on imports from the outside for our electronics. Currently, these imports occur at a low, informal level, if at all, and such, and as such, the electronics in many parts of our territory are severely outdated. However, if we were to begin increasing such imports and looking into the workings of foreign electronics, we may be soon to able to get, produce our own, allowing us to further close the gap with the outside world in both military and civilian sectors. Which would be very good to do. Oh, we actually have 10 divisions. Look at that. We actually do have quite a few more divisions. Um, this cavalry division is okay. It's only 10 combat width, which is not very good, but yeah, it is what it is, you know. After that, education for all? Yes. <clears throat> the current education system within the territory we control is reprehensible and must be corrected immediately. Outside the largest cities, formal education is often either severely lacking in supplies and current information, if it is available at all. Even in the cities of the region, schools are often understaffed and the morale of the teachers they do have is very low. In order to lag the game up, but in order to improve the situation, we've decided upon several reforms worth implementing. These include higher pay, recruitment campaigns, and sending school supplies and up-to-date books to rural areas. This will make education more available to the entire population and bring us closer to equality. Nice. And what do we have here? Initial propaganda campaigns. And eh, we're going to not do that for now. And restore the universities. Yes, please. And helps reduce the administrative strain on our current state. In large cities within our territory, such as Novosibirsk and Tomsk, there have been long been impressive universities, and although their standing has been greatly damaged by the collapse of the Union and then of the CSR, they continue to operate, however. The unification of the region under our control has proven to be the final straw, and they were finally forced to close. Of course, we will reopen them, but to avoid the reactionary lies of the past, we will apply our own education methods, and thereby bringing them to new heights of prestige. Nice. At least we got 10 divisions. And Irkutsk did finally reunify the Far East, so, so we have... WRF, Omsk, and the Irkutsk group. So, uh, we're pretty much neck and neck with these guys over here, so we'll have to wait and see what happens, but let's go in and do poverty relief again. And I did, like, because we t stripped away some of the power from the army, I'm just giving this to the citizenry for now, so. Because I don't want to spend PP here. I just don't want to spend any more PP for this stuff. No fighting in the war room. Nice. Lieutenant Dimitri slammed the door in the face of the complaining soldiers outside of the officer's mess. He wiped his brow, sweating outside despite the chill outside. The men are even more rowdy than today, he remarked to his fellow lieutenant, Casimir. Indeed, Casimir responded, brushing a hand over his new coat. It has to do with the elections, the first remarked with the full certainty. Indeed, said the second, leaning back in his chair. The men are more upset than I thought they would be, Dimitri added, taking a seat beside Casimir now. He took up a hot kick on the table and chewed greedily. Well, wouldn't you, said Casimir. Now, given the other man his full attention, the soldier elections allowed the men to choose whoever they wanted. We had to scramble to give them everything they wanted to keep some semblance of order. Even with total command being swapped over with whoever could promise them more privileges, it was madness and it benefited them most of all. And what should we do now? Ignore them completely, Dimitri asked Casimir. The other man only grinned in response, then stood up and went to the door where the mob was still grumbling. Without fear, Casimir swung it open, causing the metal to slam against a barracks wall with a boom. Oi, he shouted. His fist banging on the wall three times dispersed a lot of you, or write you up for insubordination. This is the officer's mess. With a few mumbling replies that went unheard by either lieutenant, the crowd broke apart without incident. Casimir looked over to the first, see? Now we can do whatever we want. So let's have some tea and peace without having to listen to their crapping or, you know, complaining all darn day. Rank has certain advantages, does it not? It does. 
Cool. And we can do that one. Civilian wealth, though. Yeah, let's do that one. We have many, many challenges in trying to reestablish a functioning economy, but we do have one enormous asset to leverage in response. The lands we conquered and secure. Siberia, Siberia possesses resource wealth almost beyond measure, and we must take advantage of this in every way possible. We will therefore survey every deposit we can find and begin extractive operations as quickly as possible. And we might do the international field as well. Despite being essentially an army with this state, Premier Vasilevsky understands the importance of good relations with foreign powers. The shared opinion of many in the government and the populace is that a revolution will not last long without our involvement in the world. To successfully reunify Russia, we required trade and diplomatic prestige and military material support. Bukharin's relative isolation was of one of the many nails in the coffin for Mother Russia during the Great Patriotic War, and we will not make the same mistakes twice. In our new Russia, we shall sit among the greatest powers in the world, working together in the fields of economics, science, and military prowess. We will no longer be the black sheep of the global community, but a proud member of it. While this is all good to dream about, it will never become a reality if we do not act on it. The government is currently getting to work forming these various connections, and they will be hopefully be the ones which ensure the survival of of our nation very good keep spending and let's get some more stuff done almost 3 billion that's not terrible it could be a lot worse actually 20 and 7 not great but staffing your universities with the recent decision to reopen the university of central siberia we must decide who will be teaching the next generation of students there are plenty of academics and intellectuals across their territory and we could easily ask these men and women to work for us unfortunately not everyone in central siberia agrees with our regime and not everyone in central siberia agrees with our ideology well, each school's curriculum will be updated regardless. Having ideologically divergent academics spreading their biases to their students could fo foment dissent within their populace. Many argue that intellectuals adhering to deviant ideologies must be purged and kept far away from any impressionable pupils. Others argue that experienced academics are a precious resource and that beggars can't be choosers. If we just ensure that they have proper oversight, they argue no problems should occur. Regardless of how much trust we have in these intellectuals or our universities, we'll need professors if they are to reopen. We can either choose only professors dedicated to socialism and purge the rest, or ensure that the brightest minds of Siberia are employed, even if we they we may disagree on politics. Must we staff with the best and brightest Siberia's offer? Reactionary ideals must not be allowed. Uh, since we're going to civilian one, we're going to go the only universities must be staffed with the best and brightest Siberia has to offer. So this one, we'll do this next time. So, cool. And over the Asian continent. I did want to get this one so we get some more consumer goods. Actually, right now. No, we're actually looking really good. Minus 1%. Uh, yeah, we'll probably do this one next for more IC. Hopefully we get more and more artillery. Fighters looking not too bad. Castle not looking great. And transport helicopters. Oh, we have 11 divisions now. Nice. How is this coming along? 475? Almost roughly one a day? Roughly one a day? That's not too bad, actually. That's really not too bad. Infantry divisions, goodbye. Same class, new material. Victor had managed to avoid being drafted into the Republic's army when the Communists had invaded, and now they'd once reopened their universities. Victor could pursue his education once more. Victor had been a... Ooh, look at that. A little nervous when the University of Tomsk had been covered head to toe in red flags and propaganda, worried that it was a sign for what's to come. Victor was surprised to see that... Uh, Professor Abramov was still teaching Victor's history course, considering the man didn't strike Victor as much of a socialist. He quickly sat down in his seat as Abramov began his lecture. All right, class, this is our first time meeting since the universities reopened, so there's some administrative matters I have to review first. As I'm sure you're all aware, the CSR is no more, and now we answer to the People's Revolutionary Council, who are now funding this university. Abramov looked especially unhappy after finishing that sentence. Secondly, the curriculum has been updated, your exam has been delayed to accommodate for the new material, and your final exam will no longer be cumulative. I'm sure you're all rather pleased about that development. The final announcement I have before I begin my revised lecture is that we will be returning to a more in-depth view of the late Russian Empire. Your papers regarding the consequences of the Second World War will not be graded, apparently. Our new employers don't wish for you to learn about Bukharin's failures. Ha <laughs> ha! Victor could tell Abramov wasn't very happy about any of these recent changes, but he gave the lecture anyway. The rest of Victor's professors were less overtly negative, although some of them also weren't particularly enthusiastic about the new communist government. Uh, does that mean Chapter 7 won't be on the exam, sir? So why should I pay attention? That's a good point to bring up. Why should I pay attention if it's not going to be on the exam? I just want to graduate. All right. Cool. Military construction is done. Great. Because we will need to build some military factories eventually. So boom, boom, boom. Looking not too bad, my friends. But resources? Yes, please. And then, ooh, military factories. Ah, oh, let's get this one. Novosibirsk civilian industry. So Novosibirsk, as a larger city in Siberia, possess considerable concentration of civilian industry. Now that both the city and those industries belong to us, we must act to expand them and compound the local advantages of concentration. We will promote the operation and further expansion of these industries and still increase the state's industrial output by a significant amount. Good. Very nice. How are we looking here? Ah, oh, 20 and a half. Um, let's go do this one more time. Hiring foreign instructors, and then we're going to go ahead and increase the amount of construction we have for our budget. The budget construction stuff. Cool. Oil exploration would be nice. Connecting the cities, not bad. Noble, Norilsk Legacy, expanded industrial centers. 
prepared for war. We'll save this one when we do the military side. But for now, we're going to go down to expand industrial center. So that'll be nice. Four days left, not bad. And we have a minus 100% uh, stability. Oh boy. No wonder the resistance was always going up earlier. No wonder. Friends in the Western Hemisphere? Oh, we could do that. Consumer Goods Factories goes down as well. Army Professionals will go up as well. It's not too bad. Um, hmm. I don't mind doing this. Costing 5% of our current GDP. It's better to do this now than later when our GDP gets even higher and higher. Nova Sibiris, as the largest city in Siberia, possessed considerable concentrations of civilian industry. Now that both the city and those industries belong to us, we must act to expand them and compound the local advantages of concentration. We'll promote the operation and further expansion of these industries and so increase the city's industrial output by a significant amount. Is that the same one? I think I just read that one, right? So we're doing that one. Um, let's do keep doing our land doctrine, maybe. We're not fully done with it, so let's get that one done. You know, we should get some blueprints for that stuff. Let's go do, boost that up too. Nice. So we should be able to 20 and then not bad. 12? Looking a little better. Not bad, not bad. It's gonna take some time to get there, but that's okay. Camarovo would be nice to get up as well. Yeah, that one. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Well, that kind of sucks. Huh. Debt will rise a little bit, that's fine, whatever. Um, no, that's not the same. Yeah, that's not the same. Okay, that's weird. Distant days. Sitting alone at a table for two in the barracks mess hall, Leonid Brezhnev looked ahead in contemplation. How long has it been since he thought since he had some time alone? Not since before the war, surely. The big one, the second war to end all wars, which, like the first, it hadn't. Leonid, a voice called to him, and Brezhnev turned and saw his friend Pavel Betitsky running up to him. So I'm so sorry I'm late. Drilling the men took longer than I thought. Taking a seat, he looked towards Brezhnev and his and the eyes with concern. You never asked to meet me like this. What did you wish to speak to me about? A moment of silence passed between them. Do you remember Ukraine, Pavel, the fields, people, in the grand cities? Batitsky blinked in surprise. Well, yes, how could I forget? It's harder to forget your own home and neighbors. Brezhnev let out a sigh. I suppose you're right. I just miss it so much, Pavel. The Germans took everything from us, and I live in fear that we won't be able to get it back. More than anything, I want to go home and want that home to be free. With a gentle smile, Batitsky reached across the table and placed a hand on Brezhnev's shoulder. And it will be one day, comrade. We'll make sure of that. We can't let it all have been for nothing. Hopefully. And let's do Friends in the Western Hemisphere. The Americans will provide the greatest chance for a global recognition, home to the OFM. The last bastion of the free world and enough resources to fuel any nation as well as being relatively closer to our nation than Europe. Our diplomatic corps have placed great importance on the region. Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. of A. each offer avenues for negotiation and diplomatic association. While one of the diplomatic envoys is touring Parliament Hill in Ottawa, the other two are going for dinners in San Fran and meeting with government ministers in Mexico City. Regardless of their initial success, our efforts will certainly pave the way for stronger and more formal relations with each of these powers. Nice. At 12 divisions, not bad. Spend, screw it, keep spending money. We need to spend our PP for this stuff. We can build faster, 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 faster. And keep training the soldiers, too. Deals with the OFN. Well, the OFN is a quagmire down on their luck, bourgeois democracies. They offer our best chance for military and economic aid. We both share many goals. The destruction of the fascist menace in Europe, the reunification of a free world aligned in Russia, stable as well as a prosperous economic growth, and the strengthening of our militaries against any threat which may face us. Since the fall of Europe, OFN policy has dramatically softened towards communist and communist aligned nations. This is great news for us, as despite the strong differences in our government type, it pales in comparison towards the desire of crushing fascism, as well as eliminating the scourge of Nazism in Germany. Every Red Army soldier who fought and died on the Eastern Front will be vindicated with an alliance with the West. How much every American soldier who died on the hills of Scotland will be vindicated once Russia proves a useful ally crushing the German Eagle once and for all. We get better uh, international trade and uh, yeah, it'll be very good. Cool, the Americans arrive. Momentous news today is as an American diplomat, along with their entourage, has arrived in our capital making bearing a missive from the government. This missive makes it clear that they are to formally extend recognition to our government from that of the U.S. and thereby commence official relations between us. Many within our administration consider this as excellent news, reflecting as it must be seriousness with which the U.S., a major global power, considers our claims to a national legitimacy. This may be true, but it's also potential cause for concern. We have long upheld the ideals of the right army and of socialism, and as such other prominent officials have publicly stated, we must be vigilant for signs of capitalist aversion. And we will be. We have sacrificed too much and lost too many brave comrades to do anything but that. The preeminent position of socialist ideals within our state must be protected by any and all means possible. All organs of state will stand ready, as they always have, to combat any subversion and should it be detected. However, and at least for now, we can take pride in the ever-increasing international perception of our government and the perception of its right to govern Russia as a whole. We must be cautious, but also aware of the opportunity. And let's, let's actually go and extend the line all the way over here. Well, that'd be nice. We almost have a division made. 
and hopefully this time we can keep it. And then foreign advisors. While our military has learned many lessons during the West Russian War and subsequent World War period, our army will never reach its full potential without the help of foreign nations. Our officers could learn a lot from American ones, our doctrines have many flaws that only the Italians could catch, and our training methods won't grow, will grow stronger with the Japanese pre presence. Given the successes of our recent diplomatic efforts, it would only make sense to try and attract foreign attaches for our nation. While the military would receive the most prominent benefits from this initiative, economic advisors would also go a very, very long way to ensure the efficiency of our production lines and allocation of resources for our people. While we cannot offer much at the moment, hopefully the lip service done in favor is promised by the diplomatic corps is enough to at least bring some sort of foreign aid to our nation's army and wallet. Um, what is this? Identify this. Okay, Central Asian countries, search for recognition. Eh, that's kind of okay. Uh, let's do enter the military front. I don't want to increase their debt yet. Nope. BISC military industry. BISC is a reasonably sized city, and consequently, it has a reasonably sized population. What it does not have, the product of a long years under the previous regime, is any appreciable amount of military industry. We must correct this. We'll target our next program of expansion on BISC and the lands around it, and put the people there to work for the good of the armed forces, and thus, the good of the state. Oh, we made renovations. Look at that. 14. Yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. It looks like we've capped out on the amount of construction we can spend, which is fine with us. No helicopters yet, but that's okay. 50 again. Nice. Um, what do we want? Agriculture. What kind of we're doing really quite well on that stuff already. Industry. Ah, uh, technically that'd be good to do. I think we can wait to do that one yet, though. Equ let's do equipment. Get more infrastructure. Get more infrastructure. That'd be super good to get. Foreign advisors. Great. Military factories. Where are we going to put these guys? Well, we need more cast, of course. Other than the cast? Are we missing anything else? We're looking quite good on everything, then, actually. So, we're, we're kind of okay for what we need. Except for planes, of course. But Norilsk Legacy. The enormous resource deposits at Norilsk, a crucial supportive plan of Bukharan's Siberian plan, are under our control. Though they have been subjected to many years of neglect and decay, they are still there and they are valuable. We explore what remains of them, hopefully returning them to operation and direct this important resources they produce and process into other industries towards their benefit. Nice. Very good. And we're just missing a few more. If you'd like to read about better army professionalism, please go right ahead. Excellent news, excellent, excellent, excellent news. Great, we lose quite a bit more political power, but we get more attack and defense. We barely get any political power, man. That sucks. Without boost, we get 0.51 a day. That is just not bueno. Hey, that's looking better, though. Nice, 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 nice. And actually, for doctrine here, um, thanks we're with them. Right hand of the soldier, support artillery, helicopter stuff. Advanced training would be very good, too. I'm not actually seeing a lot for land doctrine here. Of course, we do get strategic theorem versus warlord era. Two of them, so if we get two, we'll get one more. Cool. Norris Legacy. And then we, of course, we will connect the cities. With the Siberian territories that we control, there are major urban centers and concentrations of industry. The problem, however, is that they are separated by vast distances, and the infrastructure connecting them is often old, poorly maintained, or just simply non existent. We will correct this by commencing a program of infrastructure construction. Connecting these cities cannot but provide enormous economic benefit, and potentially more besides. Nice, so that's good. We're looking very good here. This is all done. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, we actually might want some better stuff here, too. Let's get some better trucks, maybe? And then we'll work on more of our infantry stuff, so. Not bad. 6.4% not great. 12% not great. But 4 billion is not too bad for annual deficit. It's better than what it has been, so. And the political struggle, it's not doing anything, so we're not going to touch it. Uh, we can fight the black market influence, but we're kind of okay for now. Regional stuff, that's okay as well. So, I think up next, we're going to go in and do... Oh, we just got one, one more thing back here. Land reforms? I don't mind that, but, eh. We got one more thing here, done. I'm not sure what it was, but connecting the cities. Well, we can wait. Expand the industrial centers. Our efforts to expand the state's industrial base has been very successful, but there's still more that can be, and therefore will be, done. We now possess the means to begin another program of construction within our industrial centers. This time, however, our focus will be on efficiency, both of the construction itself and of the factories and the plants resulting. Hopefully in time, the focus will help our economy as a whole improve. The rates, interest rates on our debt will increase. That is not great, but oh well. Equipment, academic base. Uh, what is not increasing? Everything is increasing by quite a bit right now, which is good. Um, academic base could be better, but it doesn't really matter to me too much, honestly. So let's go with whatever help our industry. Because when it hit 1970, we still want to have a better industry anyway. So, oh, look at that. Do we make the planes? We have not, which is fine. Go and do that too. And there goes Wales. The I and Isle blaze once more. Beautiful. But we a week left, and we made one more division, maybe or something. And there goes Wales. Didn't last very long. 
Because now we're out of manpower. God dang it. It's alright, we're not going to delete that division yet, just because we'll get a lot more manpower once it hits 1967, or 69 actually, so that'll be good. And expand the centers. Good. And then, we can do this stuff up here, which we probably should do, into the military front. The Red Army now stands victorious, rising high from the frigid plains of central Siberia to the harsh steppe of Mongolia. While the time is not yet right to unite the rest of Russia under the rightful domain of Premier Basilevsky and the Red Army, many in the high commanders are suggesting a major doctrine overhaul and general army reform. Yes, our men may be equipped and our vehicles may be running and we are ready to fight, but if we are willing to stand up towards the rest of Russia, further professionalization and standardization of our methods will need to happen. Already, the members of the High Command gather in the capital, discussing the wars we have fought, how they were won or lost, and what we could have done better, regardless. In the coming weeks, the Red Army will have a new, glorious direction, one so perfect that no other army in the regions, or the other regions, could stand in our way. Get more army XP that we don't really need, but interest rates on our debt will increase. Oh, that does not feel good. That really does not feel good at all, but that's okay. More construction speed would be very good to get to. Nice. And then, Warlord Era Legacy. Our current strategy revolves on military conflict is focused around the recent experiences of our battles through the Warlord Era. Throughout the areas of conflict spanning our region of the Russian Anarchy, our men and officers have adapted a particular set of techniques to be executed in a flexible, combined manner. While this doctrine has no particular set name along among the High Command, many consider the prospect of utilizing these recent combined arm operations to the highest effect and reforming them to deal with the other states of the Russian Anarchy. Her army was born with men and will live or die on the backs of men. As such, it is crucial to apply the lessons we have learned during our regional reunification and battles with other warlord states to support these men in the best way we can. Premier Vasilevsky has given the plan the green light this time with a particular focus on adaptability as well as general infantry interoperability. May it serve our army well enough to reunify our lands. Oh, nice. Resources. Keep going with the resources. I want to extract as much as possible. Even though it doesn't really matter too much. Yeah, it doesn't really matter too much. Maybe we'll stop doing resources for now. But that's okay. Poverty yet? No. Okay. Stability? Um, you know what, let's get that one. We could, we could use more War Sport 2. And that'll help us with the resistance too. So if we can get less than negative 100%, that'd be kind of nice. And our men will march. An old myth told by the invading Wehrmacht was that only half of our troops were given rifles due to the massive size and raw manpower of the Red Army. We are not ready to put this disastrous myth to rest. Our men will march into any battle carrying the finest revolutionary equipment that we can manufacture. SMGs, assault rifles, protective clothing, proper support equipment, and steady rations will be guaranteed for men in our service. Another myth was told by the invading Wehrmacht. One that our troops were untrained barbarians, nothing more than simple peasant conscripts to be slaughtered in a meat grinder. The modern German soldier would cower and flee out our, flee out our new men. Hardened by rigorous training standards with prowess in both attack and defense, and a full theater of combined arms support equally as experienced behind them. The Red Army will no longer be an insufficient force, but rather the standard for infantry focused armies all across the continent. Wherever our men march, victory marches behind them. So basically, for basically the end of the game, weapon equipment, weapons and equipment research speed goes by 20%, army XP gain goes way down, but we get more attack and defense. Nice. And China finally modernizes. Pretty good, China. Good job, guys. Poverty relief, I believe that would be a very good thing for us. Good. And we still have minus 100%, which is... Ooh, baby. Not good. Not good. Army of the tund Tundras? We should do that when we get more army professionals per month. If the Red Army is to stand dominant across Russia, they must be. They must master the Tundra. My apologies. Let me go and get this one down real quick. Thank you. My apologies about that. So, yeah. If the Red Army is to stand dominant across Russia, they must master the Tundra. Siberia is a land of many climates and landscapes, but is most notably dominated by specific climates and terrain. Our men are accustomed to this, but further training and hardening will do wonders for their performance in the field. The climate of central Siberia is our friend. It'll make us prepared for any conditions we may face across Russia, and it'll punish any unprepared invaders trying to seize our lands. As such, it is paramount that our men become known as their army of the tundra. Winter training exercises will become the norm, followed by special equipment to help our men with the cold acclimatization. Furthermore, a general water and snowproofing of our important equipment will go a long way in any war we shall fight across Siberia and beyond. The other containers for Mother Russia may doubt such measures, but we will be we will be ready regardless of their perceptions. Great. If you like to about this, please go ahead. This happens every campaign, so it's different, I guess. Nice. Expand helicopter divisions? That'd be nice, but yeah, we might as well do that one. Few can deny the utility of our air cavalry formations. The mobility conferred by their steel mounts allow our commanders to make use of once unthinkable tactics, and time after time again granted our men the ability to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Yet, their numbers are few, and their equipment old and worn out. As such, a program to modernize and expand our air cavalry formations shall be initiated. New pilots and new soldiers shall bolster the ranks of our elite airborne troops, while expanded training facilities and modern production lines will ensure that our forces will go into battle properly trained and fully equipped. While the mountain saber may be consigned to history, the legacy of the Red Horsemen shall live on in the skies. I get this is more transport helicopters, but I wonder which regular are, are they like the early helicopters? Are they like 1960s helicopters? So that'll be good to know, but it is what it is. Cool. 
And I just wish that our helicopters would reinforce. Please reinforce whenever we have them, but they just don't. You know, it sucks so much. What's the point of having divisions if they don't reinforce? But, right hand of the soldiers. Men alone cannot win our wars, backed by powerful guns and the right support, however. They can defeat any foe. One of the most powerful compliments to an infantry fighting force is artillery. While the use in tech has changed dramatically since the First World War, artillery is still crucial for bombing enemy positions, destroying emplacements, and raining heck fire from a position advantageous to our men. Our current artillery technology is dramatically outdated. Our shells lack potency, our existing pieces are aging, and artillery crews lack sufficient equipment as well as training no more. Starting now, the Red Army will undergo a massive artillery renovation and revitalization. Our freshly manufactured quality guns will obliterate our enemies with powerful shells, all while our men make precise marks and calls for the artillery itself. When the foes of the Red Army hear the sky roar, they shall run in fear, for death is now imminent. Nice. Since we're talking about it, we'll have to keep expanding artillery then. Nice. Very good, very good. Uh, pursue favors? Nope. And hire important instructors. We're going to keep going that way. Only four and a half every month, but political interference. Eh, we're getting close to the professional army, so that's actually quite good. And then foreign weapons? Why not? Oh, but after vertical envelopment and finishing off our land auction, finally. Good. Uh, well, I actually got that one too, so there you go. Um, we can do that one, but let's keep going with guns. I like guns. Foreign weapons. Many of our weapons currently in our storage are either relics of the Patriotic War or barely working at all. We should work to make diplomatic contact with the international community to get access to new modern weapons that will give us a necessary edge over our enemies. The Americans, Japanese, and other European powers will likely be willing to assist us in sending these modern weapons. However, we can't always expect to receive weapons for free, so we may need to have a few agreements so that will be necessary to receive the guns, support equipment, and anti-tank equipment we need. It will all pay off once we reunite Russia. If you'd like to buy better industrial equipment, please go right ahead. We have factory complexes. Complexes? Nice. Very, 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 very good. How are we doing it? 20, 20, two, two and a half, basically. Full lines of production are good. Salazar is dead. Juan Caldillo is dead. Goodbye. Seven point Wow, look at that dead interest. Holy Jesus Christ. We made a deal with one heck of a devil. I say that. Oh, my goodness. That is not good. And the Soviet war machine? Yes, please. With... Wait, they recognize the arms government? America. Come on. With our army reforms complete and our military modernized, we are ever more prepared to retake the motherland. The Red Army is now one of the strongest and most powerful in Russia, ready to take on any reactionary threat. Our new capabilities first far surpass what we once were. And our enemies should fear our might. Yes, rapidly improve more, 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 more. Are we out of equipment? We're probably just out of manpower. Cass is not looking great. Oh, West Siberian Provisional Authority. Oh, Omsk. They actually might win. Holy crap, they're actually pushing out from the Urals. How do you get how's your go to looking though? Up to 25 divisions. We have 17. I actually have 17. That's actually really nice. I don't want to train. Oh, actually, technically, I guess we did train. How is the equipment for these guys looking? 900. Um, they're full for now, but we'll see how long that lasts. Soviet War Machine. Thank you. And... Omerinos. Weapon shipment arrives. The fruits of the state's efforts to secure sources of material abroad are now apparent, as a shipment of weaponry has arrived at and across our borders. Encompassing arms of many kinds and for many purposes, the shipment promises to significantly reinforce the combat ability of our many factory or military formations. Division of the shipment has already begun, as elements of our military's quartermaster corps make decisions on which units receive which items. Furthermore, figures within the high command have already begun to propose the employment of these new weapons in the near future, in one of the myriad campaigns that our armed forces are sure to find themselves in. Though none can be sure as to whether their proposals will be heeded, all know that for at the very least the state soldiery is much better equipped to further them if desired. Distribute them immediately in Red Air Force. Our Air Force is nothing to home is nothing to write home about. Its planes are old and out of date, flying from air bases that consist of little more than a grassy field with some supporting infrastructure and routinely found themselves un outmatched by our adversaries in the skies over central Siberia. If we are to reunite Russia under our banner, the situation needs to change and with the industry and resources of central Siberia under our control, we now have the means to do so. A program of investment into the Red Air Force will help bring them into the modern age. New airfields, new aircraft, and the facilities to train a new generation of pilots in the art of aerial warfare. Nice. Air bases and infrastructure. Since we're talking about air stuff, we definitely could need some better stuff from than planes from World War II. Probably. Political struggle. Is this doing anything here? Nope. Don't want to look at it. Because if we don't look at it, then it's okay. And it is... Oh, it's 68. We're halfway through 68. Not bad. Not bad. We're blazing through this pretty quickly. I like it. And we'll have one of these ready to go soon. Oh. Um, if you want to read about that, please go ahead. The revolution lives. Out of the depths of Siberia, the Union returns. There you go. I guess more PP. Nice. I would like more construction speed, honestly, but we'll see. Research base, facilities, heavy machinery, 
Um, let's do... Actually, how is this looking? Oh, we have mass mechanization already. Yeah, we do. Yes, I said that one earlier. My bad. Uh, factory complexes. Industrial equipment. Land reforms. That wouldn't be bad, though, but... Nice. So, we War Machine. We'll do Red Air Force. And we'll do Bomber Focus Action. Battlefield Support. Fighter focused. Air Sovereignty, huh? Well, we've, we've got a lot of cast. What's the air doctrine like? Air supremacy, air parity, air sovereignty, which I almost never use. Air supremacy, global force, what was the other one? Air sovereignty, battlefield support. Ah, close air support attack. I almost never use this one. You know what, maybe we'll go down the side. Let's try this one. Battlefield support, we could probably do that one. Ah, so we'll start that going down that way then. Let's do bomber focus doctrine. The Great Patriotic War and recent campaigns against the Pokrishkin's secessionists and Novus Sibirsk have taught us that the value of bombers. And yeah, let's go do that one first. Versatile and well rounded, they're capable of heavily damaging enemy industry and infrastructure, as well as supporting our troops on the ground with tactical airstrikes. As such, a plan to develop and produce new bomber designs shall be initiated. While a parallel program was aimed to familiarize our pilots and commanders in their use of operation, in their use in operation, reorienting our air force around these versatile aircraft, the enemy will learn to fear the, these terrors of the sky. Cool, and let's keep going down this stuff. Might as well. And we'll finish off with over the Asian continent. Suffering under the Japanese boot, the peoples of Asia have much in common with us and our goals. On the other side of the coin, Japan is one of the world's major powers, and securing recognition by them would go a long way towards improving our legitimacy as a state. Even if we don't particularly get along as such, it would be wisest to open up diplomatic relations across Asia, to simultaneously undermine the Japanese and strengthen ourselves through their power. To accomplish this, emissaries will be dispatched across Asia to establish contacts and seek to open embassies. But if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we'll go to war with Irkutsk, and probably with Opsk. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day!